Hello, today I'm going to be doing a demonstration of running Fortran code via Windows Subsystem for Linux. So the first thing that we're going to do to install the WSL is we're going to open Windows PowerShell and we're going to use that command there, WSL dash dash install. PowerShell should be available by default on your Windows machine. Once you see this message, the installation has begun. You'll be prompted twice asking if you want to allow changes to be made to your computer. That's the black screen that you just saw. Answer yes to both of those prompts. The actual installation itself is quite time consuming, so I have taken the liberty of speeding up the video here. After the installation completes, you're going to need to reboot your computer. Once you've rebooted your computer, go into the search bar and you should now be able to find the Ubuntu application. The installation will continue from there. Next, you'll enter the username and password for your Linux account. Note that when you enter your password, you won't see anything. This is called blind typing. It is recording though, and it will prompt you twice to make sure the passwords match. We want to be able to run commands as a user, the user we just created, rather than as root. If you see the word root in that green text at the bottom of the shell, check the posted resources to troubleshoot that. Next, we're going to update and upgrade some packages. So we're going to go back to that tip sheet and we're going to copy the command shown on the screen. When we paste into shell, you can't always control V. Sometimes you need to right click and that will paste. And remember, your password isn't going to show up when you're prompted for it, but it is typing as you type. At the prompt here, we're going to respond with a capital Y for yes. It should be noted that for all prompts within the terminal, in this demonstration, we'll be responding with some type of affirmative yes. Everything that's been completed up until this point can pretty much be done in Windows PowerShell, but a really nice shell to use is the Windows Terminal. So here, that can be installed by just going into the Microsoft Store, which should be available by default on your Windows machine, and searching for Windows Terminal. Here you can see I already have it installed, but this is where you would go to install it if you didn't have it. Once we have Windows Terminal installed, we can just go to the Search menu and search for Terminal. That will open Windows Terminal. Then we're going to go click that drop down so that we can enter into the settings menu. And rather than Windows PowerShell, we're going to switch to Ubuntu. I like to use the one with the penguin, although either should be fine. Then we're going to click save. While either version of Ubuntu should work fine, if you don't see the Linux installation that has the penguin with it, Try searching for Ubuntu and then seeing if you can click this install release version. Although, like I said, either should be fine. For those that are a little less familiar, I'd like to take a second and sort of talk about what we've installed here. So the WSL is sort of like you've installed another operating system sort of on your machine. So if you see here, when I go into Linux and File Explorer, and then I go into the home menu, I can see I have this folder with my name. When I open the terminal and I type ls, I see a folder called snap. And when I go into this folder, I also see a folder called snap. But I see a bunch of other folders as well. These are called hidden folders and files. So when I type ls-la, that'll show me all of the different hidden locations. Anything starting with a dot is a hidden file. Next, we're going to go ahead and navigate to the Visual Studio Code download site. Here, although we did just install a Linux subsystem, we are going to install this for Windows. It will work with that Linux subsystem. 
So go ahead and click the download, um, open the installer and accept the terms of service. So now we're going to go ahead and launch Visual Studio Code. And then we'll be prompted to select which color scheme we want to use. With that done, we're going to go ahead and close VS Code and proceed to installing Miniconda. Miniconda is like Anaconda, but it's a smaller version and it doesn't come with as many pre-installed packages. We're going to use the quick command line install because we already went ahead and we got Windows Terminal set up with our Ubuntu. So here I'm just going to go and copy each command and then paste it into that terminal. With this first command, we're just making a directory to hold all the different files. This next command, wget, we're going to be pulling everything down from the Anaconda repository. You can see it installing there, and it'll be going into that folder. Next, we're going to run a simple bash script here to install everything that we just put into that folder. And once that's complete, we're going to use this final command here, rmrf to remove recursively all of the different setup files that we just used, because we don't need those files anymore. And once that's done, we're going to go ahead and run these last two commands here just to get everything initialized. As you can see by the prompt there at the bottom, we're going to need to go ahead and close and reopen our shell so that this can all take effect. Now we're going to go ahead and reopen Windows Terminal, and we're going to check that Conda correctly installed by just typing in Conda. If you don't see a help menu like you see on my screen, go back and check the video and see if you missed a step, or check the Anaconda website for more troubleshooting instructions. Now we're going to make a directory to store the demo that we're about to do. Once we've created that directory, I can now see it when I ls, and I'm going to cd into this folder. I notice when I ls again, there's nothing in the folder, just as a demonstration. Next, we're going to go ahead and create a virtual environment to store some more of the packages that are going to be installing. Good practice is to call your virtual environment something based on what it's being used for. So I'm going to call mine Fortran Space. When prompted, I'm going to answer yes. Notice that next to my username in the green text, within the parens, it still says base. That's because the virtual environment has not been activated yet. But now when I type in conda activate and then the name of my virtual environment, this will activate it. So you can see now within the parens it says Fortran space. We'll talk a little bit more about what it means to be in and out of an active environment later on in the tutorial. Now we are using this virtual environment to hold packages, but we need to be able to install packages into that virtual environment. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go ahead and add on another location for Conda to go and look for packages, and that's what's known as Conda Forge. So the first package that we're going to pull from Conda Forge is what's known as G-Fortran. That's going to kind of be the bread and butter for everything that we're doing here going forward. So now that you've seen kind of where it's getting pulled from, we're just simply going to do Conda install G-Fortran. Make sure that within those parens you're seeing the name of your virtual environment. If you see base, you're not installing to the correct location. Once G4Tran is done installing, we want to check that we've correctly installed it to our virtual environment. So you can see within the virtual environment, I'm going to type G4Tran dash dash version. Now to deactivate a virtual environment, we just do conda deactivate. You can see I go back to base within the parens. Now when I type in G4Tran dash dash version, I see command not found. That's because it's only present within the virtual environment. Although it might seem a little strange at first, this is actually really useful for package management later on. 
The next package that we're going to go ahead and install from Condaforge is Fortran LS, the Fortran language server. This is going to integrate with our IDE, in our case Visual Studio Code. To complete this install we're just simply going to do conda install Fort LS. Now we're going to return back to VS Code. We can open VS Code from the shell by just typing code dot, and that will open it within our WSL. That's very important. It's different than just opening it regularly. We're going to allow the connection between the WSL and VS Code. When prompted, we're going to give permission to the IDE to run the different files that are in the folder. We're going to go to our Extensions tab there on the left-hand side, and we're going to search first for the C, C++ extension. Here we can see that the C, C++ extension is the first option in the menu, and we can verify that it's the correct version because it's the one that's been published by Microsoft. Within the same search results, we can also see the C, C++ extension pack. We're going to install that as well after we confirm that it's the version put out by Microsoft. The final extension that we're going to install is the modern Fortran language extension. We can tell that this is the correct one because it's put out by the verified Fortran language organization. Just for fun, I think it's pretty neat that they give us the link here to their GitHub repository. The repository would be an excellent resource if you have more questions about how the extension works, or maybe you even have suggestions for improvements or changes to it. Now that we've finished with the installation, let's go ahead and create our Fortran file. I'm going to go into that Fortran demo folder that we made earlier, and first I'd just like to point out that just to create a file, you can use the touch command, so here I'm going to do touch example. And then when I ls, I'll be able to see that example file is now present in the folder. I'm going to go ahead and use rm example since example isn't of any file type. And now when I ls, it's gone. Another option is I can do code, and now I'm going to type in hello.fortran90f90. And that's going to both create that file of the Fortran 90 type and open it in Visual Studio Code for me. Since our Fortran file is blank, we're going to go ahead and go to our last tip sheet of the day brought to you by the Fortran language organization. And we're going to just copy a piece of code from there. It's just simply going to print out the words, hello world. So we'll copy that code there and we'll paste that into VS Code. If you're not familiar with VS Code, Notice that at the top tab, there's a white circle. And when I file save, that white circle goes away. That indicates the file has been saved. So now what you see on the screen is what's currently present in the file. And just for a little sanity check, I can see that when I ls, I can see that hello.f90 file. Our file is uncompiled, so we're going to go ahead and borrow this command to compile it within the shell. So now when I paste this, I'm going to go ahead and delete this dollar sign and arrow, because that's just letting us know in the example that it's meant to be run in the shell. And when I run this, and I ls, I'll now see that I have two files. The green hello is the compiled Fortran file, and the other is the uncompiled. So when I do dot slash hello, I get hello world.